Well, thanks for the uh, warm welcome and thank you for that introduction, Ian. Appreciate that. So, uh, as was related, I'm uh, from Treaty 4 territory, Métis Nation of Saskatchewan, uh, homeland, and uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm standing on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. I'm honored to be here with you this afternoon and grateful to have been invited by NACA to speak at your Indigenous Economic Forum. Given the uh, theme of your forum is uh, access to capital, unlocking the community potential, I'm going to focus on growing economic resilience of First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities and entrepreneurs who contribute to the innovation and well-being of their peoples, many through Canada's Aboriginal financial institutions. When I was President and CEO of the SAS Métis Economic Development Corporation, or SMEDCO, we were approaching, at that time, some 30 AFIs, and I'm pleased to see that this number has continued to grow, and NACA membership of AFIs has grown to 58 in number across this country. SMEDCO is uh, among the longest standing AFIs, and I'm proud to say I was part of that as a board member in 1990 and shortly after as its CEO. SMEDCO was founded in the mid 80s with a $5 million capital corporate contribution. Federal funding under Industry Canada's Aboriginal Business Canada and its Aboriginal Capital Corporation program. That initial $5 million of a capital contribution and subsequent funding for a total $9 million has been loaned out, repaid, and loaned out again, and repaid again, and so on, and over time resulted in close to 1,300 loans for $38 million in loan disbursements. It's an average loan value of $30,000. Those loans and Métis business owners created over 2,100 jobs in Saskatchewan. And over the years, these Métis businesses, Métis business owners, and their employees have paid millions upon millions of federal and provincial taxes and municipal property taxes. These successes are not isolated to Saskatchewan or Smedco and can be found throughout the country. This is a very solid and far-reaching network of AFIs comprising NACA's membership. Most, if not all AFIs, play the essential role of being developmental lenders, lending to aspiring entrepreneurs deemed high risk by mainstream banks, falling short of a lending criteria established by mainstream banks. Unfortunately, over the generations, we've been unable to accumulate enough wealth to pull together the minimal client equity that traditional banks require, not to mention our personal net worth and guarantee was deemed too meager, meager to provide the backstop or comfort level that banks sought. And in many cases, back in those days, the levels of education we were attaining was below the mark, and we lacked that demonstrable understanding of business spent fundamentals and management experience. So it goes. In the end, through those eyes in those days back then, we just didn't measure up to satisfy mainstream lenders' criteria. But as, development, as developmental leaders, we concerned, concerned ourselves with the enterprise's ability to service its debt obligations, the credit history of the principal, and the character of that principal. And if applicable, we would recognize sweat equity as equity contribution into the project. 
the indigenous clients that mainstream lenders turned away, those entrepreneurs found their answer to their entrepreneurial aspirations through developmental lenders, Aboriginal financial institutions, Aboriginal capital corporations. And the vast majority of these entrepreneurs have proven to be some of the most industrious and bank-worthy clients. And this is evident in the limited number of loan delinquencies recorded by AFIs. I'm sure there were some trying days in the early days, especially those early days of high interest rates for our clients, followed by low interest rates, too low to cover the general administrative costs and overhead expenses, expenses of the average, average uh, Aboriginal capital corporation. But today, NACA recently reported an impressive average loan loss of only 2.4% in 2016-17. And that should be applauded. I remember sharing a similar story about a group of business executives uh, in Regina. And at the time, I think I reported something like an average loan loss of 6%. And they were totally impressed with that. If they could only hear this now. And this speaks not only to the grit, determination, knowledge, skills, and abilities of Canada's Aboriginal business owners, but also the lending skills of the AFIs. Ensuring they don't set their clients up to fail, and providing their Aboriginal business clients with aftercare and business advisory services, helping, helping them to strengthen and grow their businesses. And the accomplishments go beyond the impressive, impressively low loan losses to an ever-expanding proportion of loans being made available to underserved client populations. NACA reported 30% of loans have been provided to Aboriginal entrepreneurs under the age of 35, and 30% of them women. And I think that in itself deserves and applause, knowing that women are taking their position in the business economies and participating in it. And for many, actively participating in a mainstream economy. Not to overshadow the creation and maintenance of 4,600 full-time jobs from new loans in 2017. These numbers, are a testament to the genesis of helping aspiring Aboriginal entrepreneurs get started, giving entrepreneurs hope and a hand up, not a handout. This is the power of supporting aspiring Aboriginal entrepreneurs that would otherwise be looking in from the outside. Supporting our ambitious community members who have a strong desire to make their way their own way in the world, to be self-reliant, self-sufficient, and break away from social assistance and fully participate in the mainstream economy productively with pride. It's important to highlight and remind the federal government that those early days of one-time capital contributions, which, dis which established those Aboriginal capital corporations, was not misfit and could arguably be the best employment assistance program for Aboriginal people. The best job creation, wealth creation, and success story behind Aboriginal people's participation and contribution to Canada's economy. The power of transformation from every dollar invested by that government provided evidence to the government of the day that they were on the right track. If you examine NACA's reports, the aggregate reports of member AFIs illustrates how one dollar lent levered many dollars. For every dollar lent by a capital corporation, it levered five to seven plus dollars 
through borrowers' equity and loans from mainstream bankers. Yes, even the mainstream lenders came to the table because the capital corporations provide their clients with guidance and assistance in their business plans and their financing proposals and they're willing to subordinate their positions to the mainstream lenders to bring them in. I don't need to tell the board of directors, management, and staff of these ACCs why their work is so important. But I will endorse and advocate that work and make sure the federal government and the mainstream lenders and social impact organizations amongst us here and whenever I get the opportunity that the growth in AFIs, the growth in loans, jobs, wealth creation, contributions to the senior levels of taxation, and contributions to Canada's economy and reduction in welfare rules all indicate a sign that the future includes Indigenous people. And if we look to Statistics Canada, we can see a new reality emerging, and I'm sure the people in this room are familiar with it. And I see a genera generational change afoot. The 2016 census identified that ind Indigenous communities are some of the youngest and fastest growing populations in the country with an average age of 32, compared with 40 years of age for non-Indigenous populations. Only 16% 16, 16 of non-Indigenous youth are under 14, 14 years of age, while youth under age 14 make up 33% of Inuit, 29% of First Nations, and 22% of Métis. When our Aboriginal communities are vibrant economically, our youth will grow up to be strong and active members who will contribute to a lasting prosperity for their own children. Educational levels will rise and dropout rates will drop. Wealth creation will be measured in net worth and improve sustainable stations in life. The economic stability and knowledge created through successful businesses allows for the preservation and transfer of tradition, history, language, identity, ceremonies, and culture from one generation to the next. Indeed, the embracement and practice of our language identity, ceremonies and culture, along with following our principles, makes for good business ethics. And from my perspective, that's something we could stand to see a little more of in our lives. With all accomplishments, come some challenges, and we still have some which remain. A central challenge is the federal government's efforts to achieve reconciliation. But don't despair. Baby steps will get us there sooner than that alone. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission reminded the government in Recommendation 92 the important role economic development has on communities' well-being. The recommendation asked the federal government to ensure that Aboriginal peoples have equitable access to jobs training, and education, education opportunities in the corporate sector, and that Aboriginal communities gain long-term sustainable benefits from economic development projects. Even with the positive outcomes of the ACC network, the government has provided a limited amount of new investments to AFIs over the last couple of decades. The results and performing indicators behind the National Aboriginal Capital Corporation Association 
and its member network across Canada is a winner. It's a winner for the government that she want to fully get behind and take things to the next level. On that note, I would sit, submit for others' consideration, whether in the room or when I get the opportunity to advocate, that the network of NACA members across the country can present opportunities for regional or national alternative service delivery at the local level, for economic development, sustainable development programs, social impact programs, and outreach programs. The management staff in these corporations know how to do analysis, know how to conduct the due, due, due diligence, and how to reach into communities and deliver programs. This network from coast to coast to coast could also be instrumental in helping to establish or coordinate transportation services for rural and small communities, co-ops and credit unions. I'm going to conclude with one of the main observations from my time serving as chairperson for the National Aboriginal Economic Development Board. While overall government funding for Aboriginal files was just over $10 billion roughly 12 years ago, approximately 94% of this program spending was earmarked for social issues. And only 6% was being committed to economic issues. And those economic dollars were sprinkled across a broad family of federal ministries. Few working collaboratively, collaboratively and hence no coordination. I don't know what that picture looks like today. Don, you might have a clear perspective on that currently. But I would be interested in seeing if a more coordinated approach is required. And if the government should be taking measures today to invest more of that money and add to that money and invest more on economic and education issues with the aim of eventually spending less on social issues. Your capital corporations are in a unique position to demonstrate that increased investment from the federal government and also from private equity and other entities have a lasting effect on the social and economic well-being of communities. With fortitude and focus, I'm confident that your advancements will continue. You have a very strong network. You have a very strong association through NACA. And investments will provide and produce economic and social return. And a strong foundation for healthy development of future generations. Future generations will be established fortifying the embracement, practice, and transfer of our language, identity, ceremonies and culture for generations yet to come. I want to thank everyone for the continued hard work serving aspiring Indigenous entrepreneurs. Indigenous, indigenous entrepreneurs working determinedly towards self-determination. Thank you, create a great day and enjoy the rest of your forum. Appreciate the opportunity.